Okay, here we go, we're talking about stimulus control. All right, first off, we need to understand this three-term contingency. We haven't been talking much about it. Let me adjust my camera here. All right. um, we haven't been talking much about it, but uh, it's kind of an implied thing because we did talk about it in 324. So let's just go, go over it again. So what Skinner discovered was that basically there is this three-term contingency, this set of, uh, this rule that behavior can be described under. Now, we can describe behavior in all sorts of ways, but this is one that is very parsimonious and it has a lot of empirical support for it. Uh, it again, it came out of the animal literature, it was applied to humans, but uh, it has held very well. And up there, you notice that I said maybe a four term. That fourth term is the motivating operations that we talked about, you know, how um, the MOs, you know, the establishing operations or the abolishing operations, those can affect the value of the reinforcement. Some people write those in here, you know, in terms of in front of this thing, kind of like what you saw in the past. So some people put those MOs in this somewhere, and I, I just, it's not a requirement. The, the basic three-term contingency is there. Um, it can be modified. There are things that modify the reinforcers. There are things that modify the discriminative stimuli. Uh, but basically, it, it all boils down to this is the core of it, right? Um, with in, Inside this three-term contingency, what you have is several things. Number one, you've got a stimulus right here. Okay? That stimulus is called a discriminative stimulus. Uh, the next thing that you see is a response, and the next thing that you see is a stimulus okay, um, that is reinforcing. Right? You could have a punishing stimulus here as well. You can also use additional notation like an SR plus to talk about positive reinforcement, or SR minus to talk about negative reinforcement. But that's here nor there. Really, it, this is just about, uh, it, it, it just need to know that there's a stimulus out there, a consequence. Another way to think of the three-term contingency is that A, B, C's. And the antecedents, the behaviors, and the consequences for behavior. So keep in mind, consequences do not imply good or bad. Consequences are just a thing that happens, right? It's a stimulus that you experience as a result of whatever behavior that you've done in a particular context. And what I just said there was actually redescribing the three-term contingency. Okay. Believe it or not, the controlling factor here, the, the factor that's the most important, is actually this factor, okay? The consequence. Um, when we say stimulus control, we're really talking about this up here, but it's kind of a misnomer. So you'll see why we call it that here in a second. But um, ultimately, the, the actual powerful stimulus is right here. It's the consequence. That's the one that actually maintains or decreases behavior. This is the one that, or if there's no consequence, right, then you have extinction. And if you have extinction, then the behavior is going to go away. So the consequence is what's really important. But that consequence occurs after a response in a particular context. So what we're, we're going to talk about is how that context, uh, how reinforcing somebody or something or some behavior in that context um, is how we, we learn to do, uh, learn to perform behavior in one setting and not in another. Okay. So the idea is that the ability of, of that particular context that we're operating in and behavior, all right? So again, the, the, we've got the context and behavior is going to generalize. So if I'm doing something in situation one, so let's say location one, um, we could think of a stoplight or something like that. So if you learn to stop at a stoplight in Spokane, which you, know, you may or may not actually learn that here, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> so if you learn to stop at a stoplight in Spokane, then you go on to Seattle, it, context changed, all right? Um, but the behavior is gonna generalize. So when you see a stoplight in Seattle, you're probably still gonna stop. Right? So your behavior generalizes, and stopping in a red light in Seattle will get you reinforced. So, um, so it works, right? So the ability of this context and behavior to generalize is susceptible to new or existing consequences. That generalization ran into a new concept, ran into the same consequence, right? So it's an existing consequence. So it ran into the same thing. So your behavior then, then you learn that okay, stopping at red lights is important in Spokane, and it's important in Seattle, all right? Uh, the red light behavior is really easy to think about in terms of generalization. It gets a little harder when you think about other things as well. Right? Uh, so when you think about your verbal behavior, right? so how you speak, um, how I speak in lecture is a little bit different than how I speak on a daily basis. Right? And you don't hear me walking around giving lecture all the time, although my wife might disagree. Um, it's still you know, me. You know, it, it, I still learn to behave in one way in one setting and another way in another setting. So that, that, that context um, is really a cue to you to say that reinforcement is available for a given behavior. Right? So 
in the context of cities that have stoplights, there's a reinforcer available, right? That reinforcer, or the reinforcer available for a particular behavior, and that particular behavior is stopping at the stoplight. So if the city doesn't have any stoplights, and I used to live in a city that we had no stoplights, and I wouldn't call it a city, but we didn't have any streetlights. We had like two stop signs. Anyway, um, in those settings, there's no, there, there's no stoplight available. So stopping for a red light is non-existent so that there's no reinforced there. So there's no signal to the organism um, about what to, what's gonna be reinforced. And that's what a discriminative stimulus really does. It signals to the or organism, or to the person, that a particular response is going to be reinforced in this setting. Okay. Um, you, know, you might get away with something at your grandma's house that you wouldn't get away with at home. And as a result, your grandma becomes a discriminative stimulus for a particular behavior that will likely get reinforced. And you try that in a new environment and it may not work. So it, you, know, you go to your one grandma's house and you, maybe you get away with swearing around, around her, but then you go to another grandma's house and not a chance, all right? You try swearing in the presence of her and you're gonna get soap in your mouth or something like that. Right? Um, so the idea is, is that within each one of these contexts, we can uh, train up a particular behavior. And different contexts can hold different behaviors, um, and particular behaviors are going to be reinforced in one situation and not in another situation. And that's what we're, when we start getting into uh, stimulus control, that's what we're really talking about, is how that context is a really Im important factor over what behavior you're going to do. Okay. Still, that said, keep in mind, it is the reinforcer that's the powerful stimulus, right? It's just that the first stimulus signals that there's reinforcement of it. So about stimulus control, now we've talked about it, and you know, in this case, the example here, the visual example is pretty clear. Uh, you know, the, the, the red light person thing there, that's a discriminative stimulus saying, um, as long as you, you know, if you stay in place, you will be reinforced by avoiding getting run over by a car, right? Or something to that effect. Um, and the green one says you'll be reinforced for crossing the street. Okay, so you have two different stimuli. Um, both of those are discriminative stimulus, and they signal to you that a particular behavior will now be reinforced. Okay? Um, not, you know, not all behavior is maintained by the exact same consequences, right? So in different situations, and sometimes behavior isn't reinforced at all in those new situations or different situations. So keep in mind, we do have to talk about generalization and all these other things, and we're gonna, we're gonna get into that. Um, but the basic idea here is that, again, what maintains your behavior in one setting something else maybe may be maintaining it in a different setting right um, so reacting to um, oh, I'm trying to think here oh cigarette smoking can be a good one um, what is a signal for cigarette smoking in one environment you know in, in one environment that the reinforcers for smoking a cigarette may be escape from whatever task you're working on in another environment smoking a cigarette may be reinforced by access to your friends so the behavior is still the same, smoking a cigarette, the context has changed, and the reinforcers have changed as well. So let's get into the true definition here. Right? Behavior that is reinforced in the presence of one stimulus, and not in another, will come under stimulus control. And so that's the definition. Behavior that is reinforced in the presence of one stimulus, and not in another stimulus, will come under stimulus control. So in other words, you get reinforced for standing on the sidewalk in the presence of the red light, okay, and you do not get reinforced for walking across the street in the presence of the red light. Okay. In the presence of the green light, you get reinforced for walking across the street, okay, um, and you do not get reinforced for just waiting. Right? Again, this is about the discriminative stimulus signaling that reinforcers are available. So what happens in one particular context is not a guarantee that it'll happen in another context. And, um, and more, if we want to get into this like from a mathematical perspective, you know, stimulus control is simply the degree of correlation between a particular response and a, and a particular stimulus. And so an SD is signaling that a particular behavior is going to be a good thing to do right now. Uh, that's what we're talking about with stimulus control. So if you start to think about your behaviors that are under stimulus control in the classroom, and we'll talk about some of this, but the idea is that you got a ton of behaviors that you do in the classroom that you don't do anywhere else, and that's because they're reinforced in the classroom only, right? Um, think about raising your hand, you know, or listening to lecture. Those are things that you don't often do in other places, but in the classroom, they're perfectly acceptable, and they're, in fact, they're you know, required for the most part. So 
you do have that stimulus control going on. Crossing the street is stimulus control. You know, and it, we can even talk about crossing the street without worrying about the lights, right? So, I mean, think about it for a second. What's the one rule that you were always told growing up right, to do right, before you cross the street? Is it look both ways, right? Look one way, look the other. Now, by the way, there's a funny story about that, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. But um, so you look left and look right, and off you go. Okay. So the looking left and looking right, what you're identifying is um, discriminative stimuli. Are there cars present? If there's no cars present, so the lack of stimuli there, all right, or the distance to those stimuli, all right, to the cars, will signal if it's okay to cross or not. So there's an example of stimulus control. The funny story here is that looking left first, then it's appropriate, then looking right is appropriate, but only if people drive on the right side of the road. I learned that lesson the hard way the first time I was in South Africa, um, where they drive on the other side of the road. And so what did I do? I went across the street and I looked left, and then I looked right, and realized that I about stepped into traffic, because as soon as I looked left, the, there was no cars coming. Well, that's because cars don't come from that direction when you're stepping onto the street. They're coming, you know, if the, the lane that's closest to you, they're coming from the right side, not from the left side. So um, in other countries, you actually have to look the other direction first, right? So uh, what happened there was a case of generalization, right? Where my behavior of looking left and looking right to cross the street generalized, right? Um, but it failed, right? There was no reinforcer available for that. So um, my behavior came under stimulus control. I started to discriminate, and I learned that when in South Africa or Australia or wherever it is that I've gone there, people drive on the right side of the road, or on the left side of the road, you then actually look the other direction first. So you look right first, then you look left. Okay? So right is the close lane to you. That's where the traffic is going to be coming from. So it's a little backwards, but my behavior is now under stimulus control. Again, we've already talked about this. The discriminative stimulus doesn't actually control your behavior, right? It's the stimulus that signals that a reinforcer is, is available for a particular response. And that stimulus changes, you know, again, that stimulus can signal that one, one behavior is going to get reinforced. It can signal that a different behavior is going to get reinforced. It can signal about what types of reinforcers are available. It can do all sorts of things. But just remember that it's just a signal. It just tells you what's going to get reinforced. It, it's not like classical conditioning. In classical conditioning, the initial S, the stimulus, pulls a response out of you. It causes a reflex, right? This isn't a reflex. This is voluntary behavior. So when we think about voluntary behavior, this is how we think about it. We think about it in this three-term contingency. So the, the SD isn't what's actually controlling your behavior. Even though we call it stimulus control, it's not what's controlling your behavior. Right? It's just a signal to say that a particular response is going to be reinforced at this time. Okay? There's other ways to look at this thing. Right? We've got the S delta stuff now. S deltas are kind of confusing to get your head around, but here's the basic idea. They indicate that no reinforcement is available for a given behavior. And it, it doesn't signal that punishment is available. It signals that extinction is coming, right? Um, so it, and S deltas are kind of hard to think about, but uh, I've got an example on the next page. So again, the idea is that the, now the stimulus is signaling not that reinforcement is available, but signaling that extinction is going to happen. Right? In the operant chamber, we you know with rats and pigeons, this is pretty easy to establish because you take an S delta, you put a signal on the wall that says any response now is not going to be reinforced. Okay, and it's that simple. Um, but uh, in the real world, it's a little different. Um, you can think of a broken uh, pop machine. Right? So somebody sticks a sign on the soda machine right? that says, this machine is broken. So any response that you do on that machine, you put money into it or hit the button or whatever, it's not going to get reinforced. So that sign is a signal. It's an S delta to say that a response here is not going to get you a reinforcer. It's going to get you extinction. And that's not a good thing. So any of those signs that it, that it, that it may signal something like that um, are um, are S deltas. Um, let me think of another one here. Well, like a sign on a store. If the if the if if the open sign is off, that's an S delta to say that coming to this store is going to be um, extinguished. You're not going to get a reinforcer for it. You know, there's not, no one's going to be here. You can't open the door, so on and so forth. So let's look at how this stuff interacts with multiple, uh, with, uh, in multiple situations here. Um, so we're going to look at both SDs and S deltas, and we're going to look at two different behaviors to see that, um, that, that sort of interaction between uh, the behavior manager and the person that's having their, man their behavior managed. And the idea is that the behavior manager also is getting reinforced and punished for what they're doing. So <coughs> let's take a look at it here. You've got the behavior of the child, and you've got the behavior of the teacher. We're going to focus on the child first. Um, 
So again, a given stimulus can serve as both. For, uh, so this is a, an example, this whole line plus, it's also showing you how one stimulus can mean different things uh, depending on what's going on, or even in the same context. So a given stimulus can serve as both for different behaviors in the same context. Here we go. So as both meaning a S delta and a, uh, an SD. So here's the first one. Look at me. All right. So there's your S delta. It's a, it's a command. Right. Child looks at the person person says thank you. So the teacher says thank you and they get reinforced for it. Okay? So the kiddo gets a little reinforcement. You say look at me, but the child looks at the floor. Okay? There's no reinforcement available. In other words, they're going to get a corrective response. Okay? Um, so in this case, the look at me was actually an S delta. At the first one, it was a discriminative stimulus, but now it's an S delta. Look at me and it produces the behavior of looking at the floor. So that, that S delta and the SD have to be connected to an individual behavior as well, so don't forget that. So look at me, the child looks at the person, and, and, or, so look at me says that if you look at the person, you're going to get a thank you. Look at me also says if you look at anything other than the person, then you're going to get nothing, you're going to get no reinforcer. So in one sense, it's an S delta, and in the other sense, it's a the discriminative stimulus. So that's the behavior of the kid. Now let's see how that interacts with the behavior of the, of the adult, right? So the behavior of the teacher is going to be influenced by this correction. So the kiddo fails to look, right? That's the result. So the child looked at the floor. So the child fails to look. So that's an S del or discriminative stimulus to the teacher to model the appropriate behavior, right? So now the kid is, has failed to look. Now the teacher is doing this corrective procedure. So now they're going to model the appropriate behavior and the child imitates. So there is the reinforcer for the particular modeling, right? So you can see now that the, the teacher and the child are interacting with each other. So the, the child was, uh, the behavior of looking at the floor was extinguished, or at least it's put on extinction. It's probably not gone completely. It's only one trot. But so again, so if we start that S delta line, you say, look at me, child looked at the floor, all right? No reinforcement is available, and the teacher starts a corrective procedure. So that S del or the, the consequence for the child is also an S del or an S uh, discriminative stimulus for the teacher to model the appropriate behavior. So then the teacher goes and does the modeling, and that is likely reinforced by the child actually imitating what the teacher did, right? So then you've got this uh, sort of positive cycle. It's all interacting with itself. All right, let's look at generalization. First off, we've got a few airports, and these are some of the airports that I've been at around the world, and what you'll notice is that they're all the same. They're all airports, right? So um, you got Kigali in Rwanda, which is always empty, but it's a beautiful airport. And then Lagos, and when I was there, the sign, you know, the, the welcome to Lagos sign uh, was a little different. Um, when I was there, it just said, you are in Lagos, <laughs> which um, if you know much about Lagos, that uh, that is a, a very appropriate to, uh, a welcome to a <laughs> uh, sign. It's it's uh, <clears throat> it's not necessarily a very welcoming place, as we say. Anyway, the other one is Dubai, which is just gorgeous, and then you got Kabul, which has changed. That's the old airport. They've got a new one now, but that's the old one. Uh, the point is, is that we got stimulus generalization here. These are all different stimuli: Kigali, Lagos, Dubai, Kabul. They're all different stimuli. They're completely different airports. They don't even look anywhere alike. You know, um, they have some similar similar things about them, but they're uh, nothing about them is really alike, other than the fact they're airports. But your behavior in airports, right, is roughly the same. You check in. You check your bags. You go through security. You wait for your flight. You board your flight when you're called. It's all about the same. There's some minor differences in there about how they call the flight and if there's signs on the wall or if you're waiting for somebody to stand up with a megaphone and yell at you or whatever it may be or how many you know, dollars you have to pay off to the person to make sure your bags get on the airplane or whatever it may be. But the idea is, is that um, the general behavior, the behavior of you know, what to do in an airport um, is is the same, right? So you you respond. What we what we say is that you're responding to in, in, in a stimulus generalis. Nah, I'm saying that wrong. Basically, what we're saying is that the the stimulus has generalized. You do you have different stimuli, but your response is the same. So let's think about it in this way. Um, I was in Kigali. I think it was in Kigali before I was in Lagos. Yeah, so I was in Kigali before I was in Lagos. In fact, I have those all in order. Ah, didn't realize that. Anyway, um, so I was in Kigali before I was in Lagos, and the idea is that I got reinforced for a particular behavior in Kigali right? and uh, how to behave in airports. And now, I've, granted, I already been, I've been in airports my whole life, so the, the example is kind of contrived, but you'll get the idea. 
So I learned what to do in Kigali, and I got reinforced for behaving in a particular way in Kigali. So then when I show up in Lagos, I try the same thing. All right? So behavior becomes more likely in a new situation as a result of being reinforced in another one. So I was reinforced for a particular response in Kigali. I get to Lagos, try the same thing, and it works. All right? Get to Dubai, try the same thing, and it also works. Get to Kabul and try the same thing, and it also works. In other words, I'm talking about checking in. Okay, so just going to the counter and checking in. Now, there are things that didn't work, <laughs> right? Um, you know, how you board an aircraft in Lagos is dramatically different than how you board an aircraft in, uh, in Dubai, right? Um, it's just a, it's a different process. And by that, I don't want to get too detailed into it, but the basic idea is, is that uh, you fight to get on the airplane in Lagos, but in Dubai, it's more like boarding an airplane here where it's nice and orderly fashion and you just kind of walk through and you're all standing in line and all that stuff. That's not the case in Lagos. In Lagos, it's a race to get on the airplane. Uh, probably, you know, who knows why, but uh, that's just that's just what's developed over the years. So there's some stimulus control going on there uh, in terms of learning how to behave specifically in each one, but some behaviors are the exact same in any airport no matter where you are. Similarity is a part of it, right? Uh, you know, if the stimuli are similar, similar um, of course, airports are generally similar in some way, shape, or form, uh, but they don't have to be. You know, I mean, the the Kabul airport is not nearly as nice as any of these other airports that are on here. At least the old terminal was. The new terminal or was uh, the, the new terminal is pretty good, but. Uh, but there's quite a bit that's different as well. So in terms of things that aren't similar, you still know how to behave, right? So. Uh, if you think about all the details of the airports, you know, uh, Dubai is all shiny and there's gold and there's uh, you know, stain, polished stainless steel and in Lagos it's just more like a typical airport in Spokane. Kigali was actually a beautiful airport, um, but it was empty. There was hardly anybody there, right? And Kabul is dirty and run down and uh, was being repaired all the time and it was just, you know, it was just not a nice airport. Right? So you've got these different classes of things, right? So classes are what we think about when we think about concepts. And I don't mean classes like CDP 324, 321, or whatever. I mean like classes of things, like horses. That's a class of uh, stimuli. Dogs are another class of stimuli. People are another class of stimuli. Airports are a class of stimuli. Airplanes are a class of stimuli. There's a lot of differences within each class, but the class is the same thing. When you see a dog, you say dog. You don't say, ooh, look, a cat, right? At least not very often. Uh, the idea there is that you respond similarly to classes of behavior, right? and once you respond similar, or, or, or sorry, respond similarly to classes of stimuli, behavior classes are a different thing that we'll talk about later. <clears throat> so when you have a class, basically, or when you're responding to a set of stimuli as a class, then what we say is you have conceptual behavior. You're behaving as if you understand that concept right, of airports. So you, in order to do that, you, you need to know what makes up a concept and what doesn't. So what are the things that go into the class and what are the things that don't fit in the class? Right? So big, large buildings uh, may be airports right? or they may be convention centers or something to that effect. So big, large building isn't, isn't the criteria that you use to put a building in the class of airport or in the, build, in the class of convention center. It, it could be any number of things. Maybe it's gates or terminals or something like that that you use um, to identify that that building is actually an airport. And you get the class of airports. Or even better, you use the word airport since most buildings, since most airports have the word airport on them. Um, so that, that makes it even a little bit easier. Right? So what we have in class forming, right, or in, or in concept formation, are two things. Number one, discrimination. And number two, generalization. Right? So you discriminate within class, or I'm sorry, you generalize within classes, right, or within concepts. So all those, um, think about all the differences that exist in terms of different types of horses, right? Lots of different ways horses look, so lots of different ways that uh, dogs look, but um, you still know that a dog is a dog. I don't care if it's a little chihuahua or if it's a Newfoundland, right? Um, you still understand that they're all dogs. You're generalizing within your class there. Right? You're generalizing within that concept because uh, you know Chihuahua doesn't really look anything like a uh, <clears throat> like a Newfoundland, but you still say dog <laughs> in response to seeing either one of those things. Um, so that's the generalization. The discrimination is between classes or between groups, right? Not within. And you learn well, what is a dog, but what isn't a horse. So uh, you know, you know, the, the 
the shape of the face, the shape of the tail, the shape of the hoof, you know, you got the hooves versus the paws, you know, that type of stuff. So you're discriminating between classes. Um, but the idea there, again, is that um, you do need both discrimination and generalization um, in order to do conceptual behavior. So you need to learn what is a class and what isn't a class, and how does that what isn't relate to some other class. All right, how do we train this stuff? Well, there's a lot of ways. So before I get into that, we can say, all right, I could ask you the question, what is each one of these cars, right? So it, it's not yellow, orange, yellow, right? You know, that's just the color. Um, <clears throat> we could talk about what actually those cars are, and I think the first one's kind of a, it looks like a Corvette. It looks like some weird model of a Corvette. It might be a, uh, you know, some type of concept car. Uh, second one kind of looks like a Lamborghini, not 100% sure. And the other one, L, I don't know, Type R. It's some type of Toyota, um, whatever that is. Anyway, so the idea is, can you discriminate between those things? And maybe you can, maybe you can't, um, but <clears throat> we could train you to, right? So to develop stimulus control, the first thing we're going to do is make that discriminative stimulus distinct. We're going to make it clear. Right? We're not going to be, you know, we don't put a, you know, for a stoplight, you don't put a red light up and a slightly less red light up, you know, one means go, one means stop. You have you know, dramatic differences between those lights, right? Um, you know, same thing with these cars. There's dramatic differences between the cars. At least between the two yellow ones, there's dramatic differences. There's fewer differences between the yellow one and the orange one other than color, right? But the, the shape is going to be similar. They're both more sporty. Uh, they're both lower, you know, that type of thing. So, you, you know, to, in order to be able to discriminate between these different cars, you want to make them as distinct as possible. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that you want to do is minimize error, right? You can add verbal cues, right? Uh, to, to help you make incorrect responses impossible. This gets back to something called errorless discrimination training, which uh, we'll talk a little bit about in, in another context. But the idea is that you want to get people reinforced for proper behavior. You want to spend more time trying to get them to get it right and reduce the amount of errors they're going to make. So if I show you that first car, and I say something to the effect, I could add a verbal cue, say, here's, the, okay, the first car is going to be a Chevrolet. A Chevrolet makes one really fancy sports car, and that really fancy sports car is a, and you answer it, say Corvette. I say, you're right, it's a Corvette. So let me show you the picture. Here's a picture. What is this? This is a Corvette, right? The idea there is that I've added so many verbal cues that you basically can't get it wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we can start to do that again with the next one. A Lamborghini looks like this or whatever. And we can go through and do the verbal cues until I show you the picture and say, this is a Lamborghini. Now I can show you the two pictures say, okay, choose the Corvette. And you choose the Corvette. And then I would change the stimulus a little bit, get a different picture of a Corvette, different color, picture from a different angle, you know, that type of thing. And so I'm really teaching you that what that Corvette looks like as a whole versus the Lamborghini. Right? Lots of opportunities. So give people lots of chances to learn this stuff. You, you're never going to learn the differences, the, the, the fine details between a Corvette and a Lamborghini the very first moment you're looking at it. You're not going to learn all of them. You'll learn some really obvious ones. But the more you keep trying each one of those, learning about those discriminations and learning to tell the difference between those things, uh, the more information you're going to be able to pick out. You might even ultimately be able to see a small little piece of the car and identify what it is. Um, I've been involved in the car show world and the car club world for a lot of years now. And one of the things that we do is judge cars, right? So we, you know, car shows, we've got to do the judging and evaluation of cars in order to give out the trophies and all that fun stuff. And part of that judging is about discriminating what is a quality paint job, and it seems easy on the surface, right? What's a quality paint job and what's not? Well, when you've got two $10,000 paint jobs sitting next to each other, how, to, how do you tell the difference between them, right? It's not easy. And uh, you have to look for small little things. Uh, and the idea is that you learn to discriminate what makes a perfect paint job and what doesn't. You know, same thing goes for cleaning a car. You know, who spent, you know, how did they, did they clean it perfectly? Did they clean everything, including behind the brakes? You know, stuff like that. So we actually get down to that level of detail when we're doing car show judging and stuff. Uh, but the idea is I've had a lot of trials. You know, I've been doing that since, what, oh, I don't know, 92 Right, so I've had a lot of a lot of opportunity to learn how to discriminate between a uh, hundred point car, a ninety point car, an eighty point car, and so on and so forth. 
And you can also use rules, that really helps. Again, this is a, there's a verbal requirement here. But using rules is a very useful feature and it allows that learner to know what's going on. In fact, when we teach people about how to do judging for car shows and you know, we, we actually have a video and we walk people through and we, we, we have the, the rules listed. And so we list rules one, two, three, four, five and then examples of those rules and then do another set of rules one, two, three, four, five and so on and so forth. And it just makes it clear for people to be able to discriminate between um, <clears throat> the types of things you would see if you're judging a car show right? so in order to be a quality judge. It's all about stimulus control. All right, I'll talk to you again soon. Enjoy.